I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. Welcome to Deep Cuts, the podcast where we pick a topic and walk you through the ins, the outs, and the nitty gritty so you can appear like an interesting and idiosyncratic person at your next forced social function. Today's topic is... The Bizarre Life of Clayton Moore, a.k.a. The Lone Ranger. Who was Clayton Moore? Well, he was an actor who got his start in the serials in the early 1940s and 50s, but is most widely known for his iconic version of The Lone Ranger. However, it's not the nearly decade and a half that he spent playing the Old West hero that is the most interesting about him. It's the fact that he seemingly couldn't disentangle himself from the role and appeared in commercials, public appearances, and grocery store openings in full costume and in character for close to 40 years. Act 1. Out of the past, a shimmering shape materializes. A man, on a horse. He's wielding silver pistols and sporting an iconic black domino mask. It's the Lone Ranger, created by Fran Stryker and George W. Trendle for WXYZ in Detroit, Michigan. The Lone Ranger would become a sigil of a bygone era, a symbol of a moral code of Americana that had left the world, or maybe never existed. John Reed, the future Lone Ranger, is the sole surviving member of six Texas Rangers who are slain in an ambush. Reed's brother Dan Reed was leading the group of Rangers in pursuit of a band of outlaws led by Bartholomew Butch Cavendish, but were ultimately betrayed by a civilian guide named Collins who led our stalwart and soon-to-be deceased heroes into a dead end named the Bryant Gap. After the men were gunned down, a Native American man named Tonto discovered the bloodbath and, much to our surprise, one of the men is still alive. Tonto nurses the man back to health and then gives the newly resurrected John the name Kimo Sabe. This term, which in the world of the show means trusty scout or faithful friend, but actually is closer in phrase in real life to he who looks out in secret, which is an approximation of an Ojibwe and Potawatomi word, Kimo Zabe. One of the things that has obviously been instilled in popular culture is much more streamlined origin stories. And I'm not even saying that that's a good thing. Sometimes it's kind of boring. But the the origin stories for all of these like really early serial characters, they sound like a fever dream somebody's telling you. They're always like incredibly complex compared to the simplicity of the premise like the premises are always like really simple like oh he's a he's a masked hero that rides a horse and stops bad guys zoro he's a masked hero that rides a horse and stops bad guys the phantom he's a masked hero who rides a horse and stops bad guys but the but the origin story is always like and then his brother's third cousin came out of the darkness and took off one of his rings and put it into a box and set it out to sea adrift and a man living on a desert island discovered the ring and he cooked it into a stew. Like they're always like really convoluted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it, it's it's interesting, too, because, you know, a lot of the characters that we're talking about start out in either the pulps or comic strips and the Lone Ranger doesn't. He starts out in radio and he's so blatantly influenced by stuff like the Phantom and um you know, the classic Western heroes like Wyatt Earp or like um, many John Wayne characters um, later. Um, although I guess, he, yeah, he can't be really, he can't really be influenced by John Wayne characters because John Wayne wasn't really in Westerns in the fucking 30s. Um, I mean, he was, but not to the degree that like, you know, The Searchers and... Um, yeah, St- Stagecoach, which was one of his earlier movies, was what, 1940? Yeah, so it's that's not even true. Um, but like, yeah, I, I agree. The, but that's kind of my favorite thing about pulp characters is the like 1939. Yeah. Like I, I love, I love the weird complexity of a lot of the cult pulp characters. Um, and the kind of like lapses in logic or what I personally find really charming about a lot of them. Um, and the fact that like, you know, John Reed, the thing that's really interesting to me about John Reed as a character and the way that you know, Fred Stryker like spins it 
is that on paper, it's just a revenge story. You know, it's like John reads a guy, his brother gets killed. Oh, I almost died too. Oh man, this guy like saved me. Thank God. Okay, well now I'm going to go out and like find Butch Cavendish and fucking murder him. And like, you know, if anybody doesn't know, Butch Cavendish is kind of the Joker of the uh, extended uh, extended um, Lone Ranger lore. Uh, he kind of pops up in various versions. Uh, and in the Army Hammer version, he was going to be a fucking werewolf, like, which is so weird. I'm so glad they didn't do that. But also the movie that they made sucked ultimately, but whatever. So I just looked this up because that that name sounded familiar to me. And I was like, what what is where am I remembering Cavendish from? And uh, the and I looked it up and I realized what I did remember it from. So Cavendish bananas are like the bananas that we eat. It's the particular it's the particular strain of bananas that is the one that, ev- that is available in the US. And the reason why I know that or the reason why that's off the top of my this is totally off topic. But the, the reason that's off the top of my head is because um, so the the people have pointed out that banana flavored things taste nothing nothing like bananas. And the reason for that is because the banana that used to be the main banana that everybody ate in the U.S. back whenever bananas were popularized, going back to the Chiquita banana episode, was this other banana. And the banana flavoring is based off of that banana. But sometime in the 60s or 70s, I forget what it was. Maybe it was earlier. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. There was like this big uh, blight that happened uh, in those crops of that banana where like all of the bananas of that crop were wiped out and it went extinct and they had to replace it with the Cavendish banana, which didn't wasn't susceptible to this this uh, blight that killed this crop of bananas. And now bananas don't taste like banana flavoring because they're based on a different banana. Hmm, Interesting. I mean, we've established I don't know anything about bananas, but that's interesting. Also, whenever you uh, when you whenever you lower the temperature of something, it brings out the flavor more uh, through a scientific process where I forget what it is, but there's something about there's something about like making something colder where it makes the flavor more strong. And if you throw a banana in the freezer, uh, take the peel off, but unpeel it, throw it in the freezer, let it freeze and then eat it like a snack. It's delicious and it tastes way better than a normal room temperature banana. Fucking Spapa Spicy coming in with the uh, the hot takes on the bananas today. To conceal his identity, John Reed fashions a domino mask using cloth from his brother's vest and dedicates himself to finding his brother's killers and protecting those in need. Which is, going back to what I was saying, on paper, the story of the Lone Ranger is just like Death Wish. It's like, I almost died, my brother got killed, I'm going to seek revenge for my brother. But the thing that I love so much about it is that it's um, it's a story where that starts as like the root emotion. And then John Reed like matures out of that need for revenge and chooses to transform that emotion into love and like defends people and like spends his, the entire rest of his life making sure that that doesn't ever happen again to anybody, uh, which is such a cool, weird kind of inhuman way for that to manifest but i i love it yeah, it's like the opposite of the fugitive i didn't kill your wife i don't care cavendish is like i did kill your brother i don't care but in the opposite way where i've like let it go and i'm just gonna spread justice and hope also your bananas taste better if you throw them in the freezer for a couple hours <laughs> well even to the degree that like he you know the lone ranger has a creed that he recites in every episode of the radio show and in every episode of the tv show and every movie which there's been a, f- a lot um well not every movie he doesn't he doesn't say the creed in the shitty army hammer version yet another reason why that movie is not very good um but he has an extended creed that he says and it's not a creed out of based out of anger um you know which is so crazy by the way i don't know if we'll talk about the movie eventually but um what's his name but the guy who directed it yeah gore verbinski he made a different movie which is an amazing western which is called rango but also like the lone ranger just shouldn't be a pirates of the caribbean movie and that's what they were trying to do yeah i think that's probably the influence of it of like just make this pirates of the caribbean i mean to the degree that you know the the first like umpty dump drafts of the movie literally had magic in it you know it was like the same formula of like it's pirates but with magic where it was like it's cowboys but with magic Rango was allowed to be this weird little small thing 
Yeah, exactly. And also the fact that Johnny Depp is Tonto is just like, what is this? Yeah, well, that's a whole that's a whole other. This is bullshit. And also that movie and that movie sucks because it's like that movie doesn't want to be a Lone Ranger movie. It's made by people who don't like the Lone Ranger. What What's the Lone Ranger do? He's got a domino mask. He's a stalwart, heroic person who's put in a um, horrible situation and then chooses to rise to his better angels and stay a stalwart, heroic person as opposed to, you know, becoming a vengeful asshole. And he has an iconic costume, you know, white cowboy hat, domino mask, baby blue, you know, weird jumpsuit thing with black holsters and pistols. And does every version of the Lone Ranger have the baby blue? No, but come on. The most iconic version has the baby blue. Even in black and white, it's the baby blue jumpsuit. And the movie is just like, yeah, that baby blue jumpsuit's lame. We're not doing that. And it's like, that's like Superman's costume. You can't make a Superman movie with that. Like, that's the reason why seven seasons of Smallville aren't very great. Because they never put him in the fucking suit. It's not that hard. Yeah, the weirdest choice they made with the Lone Ranger movie is having the Lone Ranger uh, eat women. (laughs) God damn it. God damn it. Yeah, we don't have to talk about that movie, though, because I I don't like it. I love the 50s TV show, though, uh, and specifically Jay Silverheels and Clayton Moore. For me, they are the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Like, the other people who've played him have done great jobs. There's been great renditions. Even in that TV show, you know, he doesn't, he gets fired midway through and they have another guy play the Lone Ranger and then they bring uh, Clayton Moore back. But like I he in in my head, that's who the Lone Ranger is. It's it's Clayton Moore fully. He's got this huge chin and giant barrel chest. He looks like a fucking like 50s Superman drawing. You know, he's like he's everything you want in a kind of one dimensional. I do the right thing at every juncture hero. Um, And is that a is that a reason why maybe the character hasn't um superseded its initial period of supreme influence and transitioned into modern day and you know it had the he had the the 80s movie uh legend of the lone ranger which failed and then uh multiple animated shows and the uh, you know big budget disney movie which failed which as we've been talking about like is it because the character is so rigid that it doesn't translate to modern audiences maybe but i also think it's because unlike superman who's a cultural symbol and even if people don't really like him, like I'm like Zack Snyder doesn't like Superman. He doesn't. He just doesn't. But and you can see that in the movie. But because the cultural trappings of Superman are so endemically American and we just understand what they are, even when Zack Snyder doesn't get the character and low key fucks him up, there's still enough Superman in there to like grab onto that it makes money and people recognize it as Superman where like. All of the characteristics and underlying tension of what makes the Lone Ranger great are superseded by just even the idea of the movie. The idea of that movie is what if the Lone Ranger is a buffoon and Tonto is the protagonist and the smart one and he's the one that's really like doing everything, which that to me is just abhorrent. Like the Lone Ranger, and I know that there's a racial connotation to all of this stuff because Tonto obviously is one of the few very prominent cultural indigenous people or first people's characters and also for a long time culturally has been a punching bag which is not cool i don't want that i want a story where tonto and the lone ranger are equals right but he's the hero the lone the name of the franchise is the lone ranger like it's like making a batman movie and having robin be like the protagonist and batman just is like a joke the whole time like that's not what we're here for or making a green hornet movie where 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 kato is secretly the the one pulling all the strings and the green hornet is an idiot a hundred percent also i don't know if you know this I, I think you probably do but you know that that he's his grandson right yeah 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 okay it's, it's for the listener if anybody doesn't know the green hornet and the lone ranger are related the green hornet is the lone ranger's grandson and uh uh, created by the same guy, Fran Stryker. Which I love. I love stuff like that. Like, I tire of, like, MCU-style cinematic universes. Like, the things where it's, like, everything, like, all the stuff is, like, interacting. Like, conceptually, I like that kind of stuff. And I liked it a lot more before it became, like, the thing that all things had to be. 
and now I kind of tire of it. The thing I really like much more is when things are just like tangentially related in ways where it's like there might be a crossover or something like that, but ultimately like they're just these two distinct things, but they just they they like they can and exist in the same universe and it's it's like references referenced on the outer fringes of the narrative. I I love I love stuff like that. Yeah, me too. And also I just love I like the Green Hornet a lot too because I like, you know, pulpy, you know, stuff and Kato is a badass character and I mean to me pivoting Kato to be like the one who's in control actually makes a little bit more sense just because you know, the Green Hornet isn't as developed as a character as the Lone Ranger. Um but I still want a movie where the where the Green Hornet is fucking cool. Like, I don't want a movie where the Green Hornet just fucking sucks like he does in that movie. Um, yeah, what a weird movie, too, of like Michelle Michelle Gondry is going to direct a. Yeah, what a weird what a weird decision. And on paper again, on paper, a Green Hornet movie directed by Michelle Gondry where Kato is like placed front and center. That sounds amazing. And then you watch it and you're just like, this movie is not cool and not made by people who love the green hornet i think that's the thing with that and the lone ranger movie is like conceptually the idea of like it's almost something that you think would be done now like more than you know 10 years ago but this idea of like oh this character this this character who's a person of color who was like the cultural punchline or just the 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 context in which they existed in this story was at times like extremely racist take that character and be like, oh, this character is actually more interesting. Let's focus on this character and make them the hero. Conceptually, that is interesting. But I don't think it's done from a place of that in the movies. I think it's done from a place of, I think this character is dumb and goofy, the the Lone Ranger and the Green Hornet. So let's turn them into a joke. And by circumstance, the other character becomes the competent hero one. Not It's not done from a place of, this would be interesting to do. It's done from a place of like, let's make this character a joke and make it where they're actually super incompetent because it's dumb and goofy and these serials are stupid or whatever. Yeah, totally. And it, and it it just goes back to exactly what we were saying before of like, you know, it, it doesn't come from a place of somebody who loves the source material. It comes from a, we have to make a 300,000 or a $300 million movie that's going to appeal to middle America and be bulletproof culturally. Um, and it just down to the specifically like down to the point of like, you know, th- that Lone Ranger movie should have just low key been a Captain America movie in the Old West. Right. Like it's about somebody who has an unwavering moral code, is put in a position where that moral code is tested and comes out with their moral code unbroken. You know, it's it's Winter Soldier. It's First Avenger. But, you know, six shooters and the because Captain America is made by people who love Captain America as opposed to the Man of Steel route, where it's like, oh, it's a similar type of unwavering character that you can't really give a character arc to. So what are we going to do? The thing that's most defining about this character is he does not kill. Okay, we're going to give him a story where he learns that killing is wrong because he is flawed and makes a mistake and kills someone. So at the end of Man of Steel, he snaps Zod's neck. That is not a Superman story. I know that this is like a controversial thing for some people, but like you don't have to actively rape someone to know that raping is wrong and like putting characters like, you know, Superman or um, the Boy Scout archetype, Lone Ranger, Captain America in situations where their moral code is tested is a good thing because it shows the commitment of the character to that ideal and how hard it is to maintain that ideal. But at the end of the story, they still need to maintain the ideal as opposed to, I guess, the prevailing logic at that time and still to this day, frankly, is like, well, we need to empathize with the character. So we need to have them fail and then learn that that was the wrong lesson moving forward, which is like, that's not what this is like the the world of these pulp characters that were created in the 30s and these all of these characters are is like kind of dumb and simplistic they're they're moral they're the morality tales it's not fucking you know citizen kane yeah the 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 superman's character 
is that he has like the power of a god, but he chooses to do good. It's not that like he's constantly on the verge of possibly fucking murdering people and he's he's constantly resisting temptation. It's that he's just a god, but he's just like he could just be a sociopath, but he's not. Yeah, I mean, even down to the original version of Superman, you know, uh, Siegel and Schuster had a zine that they made where they made a a, a prose illustrated prose story called the story of the Superman. Or I think I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. And it's a it's a story about a scientist who invents a character called the Superman, who is like an evil godlike tyrant. And that was like their first version of the character was this cynical Oh, super, if you if somebody if anybody was this all powerful, they would be a fascist. They just would. And then after uh, Jerry Siegel's father died in a um, in a robbery, he he ran a convenience store in Columbus, Ohio, and somebody came in with a gun and robbed the place. And Jerry Siegel's father died of a heart attack because uh, he was so scared during the uh, the robbery that. Jerry Siegel like re-examined the idea and was like, oh, what if what if we took the idea of an all powerful being and made him into what we aspirationally want people in positions of power to behave like they rarely do because absolute power corrupts absolutely. But what if this person was better than the rest of us? What if this person was a literal alien who didn't have as much of the foibles and flaws that we had? So he could serve as a symbol of what we all aspire to. And that, in some ways, is what the Lone Ranger is as well, because he's a person who has this horrible thing foisted upon him and then chooses to rise above it. I mean, does he go hunt down Butch Cavendish? Yes. But he doesn't let that thing define the rest of his life, right? He becomes this symbol for law and order and just behavior in a lawless and orderless world. Um, which is a very, again, a very American idea, too, because he's not like an actual police officer or anything. I mean, he was a Texas Ranger, but now he's just like a guy operating outside the law, which when you look at the idea, it's kind of fucking terrifying that he's just like, I know what is right. <laughs> but that's the story, right? Like that's the the kind of simplicity or the dumbness of these pulp ideas is like you kind of can't. It's like Star Wars. You can't look that deep at it. Because it's a it's a fairy tale, it's a morality tale, it's a it's a pastime for children, you know, and that's why it's important because it helps instill virtue and morality, and and it serves a vital purpose in our culture. Uh, but then when you have him like, you know, wearing all black and you know, being a literal buffoon and like taunt, I just I just hate that movie. <laughs> that's why it was such a portrayal when they had that scene in the movie where where the Lone Ranger goes. Yummy, yummy, yummy to my little tummy. And then he just eats a big bucket of eyeballs. God damn it. And he's like, if anybody ever finds out that I'm doing this, I'm going to have to go sell timeshares in the Cayman Islands. Nom, 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 nom. The Lone Ranger radio show ran for 2,956 episodes starting in 1931. The show was a massive success. Though it was initially aimed at children, the show quickly developed an adult fan base. And by 1939, the show was broadcast to roughly 20 million homes. Stryker and Trendle created guidelines during this period to help shepherd the character in potential future adaptations. The Lone Ranger was never seen without a mask or some sort of disguise. He was never captured or held for any length of time by lawmen, avoiding his being unmasked. He always used perfect grammar and precise speech, devoid of slang and colloquialisms. Whenever he was forced to use guns, he never shot to kill, but instead tried to disarm his opponent as painlessly as possible. He was never put in a hopeless situation. For example, he was never seen escaping from a barrage of gunfire merely by fleeing towards the horizon. He rarely referred to himself as the Lone Ranger. If someone's suspicion was aroused, either the Lone Ranger would present one of his silver bullets to confirm his identity, or someone else would attest on his behalf. The latter happened at the end of most episodes when someone would ask, who was that masked man? As the Lone Ranger departed. His decision to adopt the moniker of the Lone Ranger was inspired by Tonto. Following the ambush at Bryant's Gap, 
Tonto observed him to be the only ranger left. In other words, he was the Lone Ranger. Though the Lone Ranger offered his aid to individuals or small groups facing powerful adversaries, the ultimate objective of his story always implied that their benefit was only a byproduct of the development of the West or the country. Adversaries were rarely other than American to avoid criticism from minority groups, with some exceptions. He sometimes battled against foreign agents, though their nation of origin was generally not named. An exception was having helped the Mexican Benito Juarez against French troops of Emperor Maximilian, as occurred in radio's episode Supply for Juarez, September 18, 1939, hunted by legionnaires from September 20th, 1939, and Lafitte's reinforcements from September 22nd, 1939. The name of unsympathetic characters were carefully chosen so that they never consisted of two names if it could be avoided. More often than not, a single nickname or surname was selected. The Lone Ranger never drank or smoked, and saloon scenes were usually shown as cafes, with waiters and food instead of bartenders and liquor. Criminals were never shown in enviable positions of wealth or power, and they were never successful or glamorous. Good work today, Tonto. We bested that villain. Want to go to Denny's? <laughs> I also, like, I also understand some of the the guidelines in theory, but, like, we never want to show the rich and powerful villains, meaning we only want to have the underclass be villains. <laughs> <laughs> that one that one of the guidelines has not aged as well as I think they intended it. Like I understand the thought and the intentionality behind it and I admire that. But also come on guys. <laughs> like you're just saying like the oppressed people who have no uh possible recourses and have had like their backs against the wall and obviously resorted to a life of crime because of that are the the bad guys. Like come on. It's bullshit. Come on, Tonto. He's not that bad. I know he tweets a lot of weird stuff, but Elon Musk is a friend of mine. <laughs> the other thing that's kind of interesting about this, too, is it, it kind of gives you um, insight into Frank Stryker and George W. Trindle as, as being like whether they, you know, obviously whether they adhered to this in their personal life is a different story. But you can tell that their their heart is in the right place and they're deeply moral people who are trying to make a positive role model. Um, which is cool. Uh, obviously, it's very flawed and deeply racist in its execution. And, you know, um, I think caused a lot of harm in certain ways. Um, and also and also Lone Ranger was like a was like a grammar Nazi. He's like, no, no, ta ta Tonto, you never conjugate a verb like that and never end a sentence with a preposition. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, but I think that there's something cool about trying to develop a character that can serve a greater purpose other than just like the financial benefit benefits of a highly successful character, you know, like they, they figured out like, oh, fuck, people are watching this. We really need to like try and make something that can serve a, a greater good, you know? Yeah. They, they went full, they went full Mr. Rogers with it. The, and the other thing that's really interesting too is that Fran Stryker and George Trindle are like involved in almost all of the stuff. Like they they are involved for a long time. Like the the first radio or the first serial, you know, the one before the movie and the one before the TV show. Um, that like Fran Stryker wrote the movie serial. Like he wrote every episode of it. Um, does it start with uh, the Texas Rangers were you know charged with? murdering these fucking asshole Native Americans who are encroaching on their land. Yes, <laughs> it's very racist. Uh, but, you know, you have to try and evaluate these things in the time that they <laughs> were made. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty it's the, the, the serial specifically is pretty racist. The newest version, which I know we said we weren't going to talk about it anymore, but like the newest version is like white men are horrible. They've just been uh, completely like fucking over these native peoples. And then we're going to cast a white man as the native dude who's at the center of this story. And we're going to put him in literal red face. Well, I wouldn't watch the, the Lone Ranger movie again. I didn't even really I didn't even really watch that like in full. Like I never sat down and watched that. It just it, that movie was in theaters when I worked at a movie theater and I watched like the whole thing in bits and pieces walking in there. And I was like, ah, I don't need to I don't need to rent this. Um, but I'm more I'm more I, I guess I'm more talking about other things like like, for instance, John Carter. Trying to read Princess of Mars to my kids, there's like there's like three chapters in the beginning of the book where it's like, let's just skip all this all these parts where he just like kills a bunch of Native Americans. <laughs> 
but it but in the in the movie it's a lot easier to watch cuz they don't they just they they avoid that part. I mean they still say he's a Confederate soldier in the movie too, which is pretty interesting that they were that faithful to the time of being like, yeah, he's a fucking racist. <laughs> he's a fucking racist. They don't though because they he's a Confederate soldier, but specifically in the beginning of the movie, he like rebels against the Confederates. He's like, "Fuck you guys." Like it's it's very much like we're going to make sure you know that this guy isn't a racist. Interesting. It's been a while since I've seen that John Carter movie. I, I didn't remember that they were explicit about the fact that he had separated from the Confederacy. Yeah. In the in the in the Edgar Rice Burroughs books, like he is like a he's a consummate military man. He is a he's a Confederate soldier through and through. And that's his whole thing in the movie. He's like a re- a rebel who like does he like was a Confederate, but then like he ch- had a change of heart and then he's like, fuck you people. And, and the whole thing in the beginning is that he gets like arrested by the Confederate general and he escapes. And, it, and it's like it's running away from them where he gets falls into the portal and goes to Mars. Uh, yeah, I read Princess of Mars maybe three or four years ago, five years ago, maybe. And um, yeah, I was pretty I was pretty one look Again, all of the stuff that we're talking about is just so deeply, deeply racist, especially John Carter, because, you know, he literally was a white supremacist and made Tarzan Burroughs wrote Tarzan explicitly to show the superiority of the white man. Um, And same thing with Connor or uh, John Carter. Yeah. Where he was like, we're even a white man on Mars would be able to take over. But it was almost interesting to me reading that specifically because of the like the areas where he where Burroughs would allow himself to be like vulnerable or like because that book is like toxic masculinity 101 um and yet is so foundationally relevant to like all of genre fiction that every other page was like wow that's an idea that's been ripped off like a hundred times and wow that's racist wow that's an idea that's been ripped off a hundred times wow that's racist yeah at least like like at least something like the lone ranger like the the racist tropes that are in it are essentially just the racist tropes of the time right this was these are bad things but they were just very common of storytelling at this time even hp lovecraft even he took his racism in his stories and was like but but we hated the shagun jabaos and they were different than us, and so they were bad. He, at least he coded it like that. But in in like any of the John Carter books, it's like I came upon a tribe of savages, and I notated that my superior intellect could best them, as they were just m- nothing more than amoebas in the in the soup of life. Like that's like every description. <laughs> it's like Jesus Christ. And also just like the only love that John Carter can allow in for like the first half of the book is like a dog. (laughs) He's just like, all right, I guess this alien dog is all right. Fine. These fucking weird forearmed green people and this sexy scantily clad red person. No, no. But this dog. All right. All right, dog. Fine. Yeah, because like dogs on Earth are already kind of like a different thing. So like you're not that you're not that different. It's not weak to love a dog. It's just like, you know, like a man and his dog. Like it's a special bond, you know? Yeah, re- real, real interesting. Real interesting peek into the mind of a man who's got some problems. From here, The Lone Ranger would appear in TV shows, feature films, Republic serials, and multiple big budget adaptations. However, it would be the TV show version of the character that would truly cement him into the cultural consciousness. Running for close to a decade and a total of eight seasons, The Lone Ranger starred Clayton Moore as The Lone Ranger and Jay Silverheels as Tonto. Moore embodied the Ranger and took the character to being a near global icon. Despite this meteoric rise in success, Moore wasn't the only person to have played the Ranger, let alone the only person to play him during the show. In the third season, John Hart joined the cast as the Ranger, and Moore was fired. However, Moore came back soon after. I've seen multiple interviews with Clayton Moore where he said, or read multiple interviews with him, where he's, he 
I don't know if this is kayfabe or not, but he said he has no idea why they fired him and why they brought him back. Uh, he was just happy to be playing the character again, so he didn't rock the boat. He's like, yeah, they they fucking they fucking Dan Harmoned me. I don't know. I don't know what that was. Six seasons and a movie, baby. That's all I can say. Yeah, uh, and they got eight seasons and two movies. Uh, so you know, there's that. Um, yeah, I don't know that I believe that, but that was the kayfabe line in the sand that he drew. So got to respect it. Moore and Silverheels returned to play their characters for a series of films after the show ended in 1956 and 1958, respectively. Moore also appeared in the 1958 documentary, The Lone Ranger and the Peace Patrol. The film is basically a propaganda film to get children to buy stamps and bonds. What happened to all the good propaganda films trying to get kids to buy stamps and bonds? You never see them anymore. And you know what you also never see anymore? any kids buying stamps they don't do it anymore they don't even know what stamps are my kids get into my kids get into my my wife's stamps and like they think they're stickers and they like stick them on stuff they don't even they don't even know what a stamp does they don't even know yeah this country's this country's going to hell in a handbasket all because they stopped making stamp documentaries while many actors have played the titular role in the series more more so than anyone else to don the domino mask seemed to have a spiritual connection with the part one that shackled him to the role in almost a metaphysical way the actor became typecast in the part something that seems almost of his own doing basically because every waking moment after the show ended proved to be defined by the lone ranger Act two, just let me open these goddamn grocery stores. Born in Chicago on September 14th, 1914, Jack Carlton Moore would later adopt the name Clayton Moore and was the youngest of three sons. Moore's father, Charles Sprague Moore, was a New Yorker who worked as a real estate broker. Clayton was a very athletic boy. He became a circus acrobat at the age of eight and later in 1934 appeared at the Century of Progress exposition in Chicago with a full trapeze act. Moore moved to Hollywood in the late 1930s and began working as a model, stuntman, and bit player. He was repped by the John Robert Powers Modeling Agency and started to gain some acclaim for his rugged good looks. In 1940, producer Edward Small convinced him to professionally change his name to Clayton, and he started getting more regular acting work around this time, being cast in four Republic Studio cliffhangers and two films for Columbia. Can we just talk about that for a second? Maybe that's just worded in a way that sounds different and it was they they really didn't have anything to do with each other. But the idea that some guy was like, "Oh, my name is Jack." And they're like, "If you want to get work in this town, you got to change that name to Clayton." And he's like, "Okay, fine." And then everyone's like, "Clayton? Well, why didn't you say Clayton? Here's roles." Like what, what was the difference between Jack and Clayton that caused the explosion of work? Yeah, I think there actually was another Jack Moore. I think that's one of the reasons why they were like, you got to change your name. I think there was a different. They just kept hiring that other guy instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, no, we wanted the other Jack Moore. We didn't want you. Oh, well, you're here. Fuck it. I get it's horrible, but I get whenever somebody has like an ethnic sounding name and they changed it to a more American sounding name to get more work. Like, I get that. It was a, a terrible racist dynamic, but there's a. It makes sense to me why that happened. But it, from Jack to Clayton, there's like, yeah, people just don't like the name Jack. I th I also think it's interesting too that he like never in a million years would I have been like, oh yeah, giant strapping brick shit house Clayton Moore was a trapeze artist as a kid. Like, what is that? During the Second World War, Moore enlisted in the Air Force and served in the First Motion Picture Unit. He made training films and starred in propaganda films like Target Invisible. Secret weapon. Radar. What would you have given to have seen these pictures in time? So this is a propaganda film or an educational military film that's basically just communicating about what radar is. Enemy. <laughs> you who destroyed the peace. It's a lot of stock you know footage, black and white. We did, you might have produced in 1945. But you We're seeing a lot of Nazis. Oh, now look at that, a Nazi flag burning. We can tell you some of the things you wanted to know. We can tell you the secret of why your destroyer, Nizuki, failed to return to Kula Gulf on the night of July 6, 1943. One of our ships saw you. 
back in the good old days whenever a, a documentary about radar just started off with a casual, oh, by the way, fuck Nazis. But anyway, radar is a thing where... Transmitted with the speed of light, picking up echoes from the Nizuki. In the fire control director, men at work, watching small screens. And now, like, a, a Nazi shoots, like, six people, and people are like, Really? Was he really a Nazi? I think you're framing Nazis. Another operator gets the bearing. So now we're seeing a bunch of footage that's not stock footage of like military guys looking into various types of technology. And Clayton Moore is going to be one of these guys like very briefly. It's it's pretty funny. Give me a course to arrive 6,000 yards, 40 degrees on the starboard bow of leading ship of Raid Able. Over. And that's him right there on the left. 6,000 yards. Here's a guy who's really good at using radar. And you know why he knows how to use it? Because he's not some fucking idiot named Jack. <laughs> this guy using radar? He looks like a Clayton. Time? 12 minutes. We don't allow people named Jack in the Navy because they're too fucking stupid to be able to operate the machinery. After being cast as the Lone Ranger in 1949, the part would be something of a blessing and a curse for Clayton Moore. It would define almost every waking moment of the rest of his life. In 1958, after the completion of The Lone Ranger and The Lost City of Gold, the final film to feature Moore, he began close to 40 years of personal appearances as the character. Grocery store openings, autograph shows, automotive dealership sales, you name it, Clayton Moore was there in full costume, shaking hands, and doing the Lone Ranger's Creed. So, just for context, because I feel like, you know, this is something that isn't really a thing anymore. Um, the last, like, three credits that Clayton Moore had were the Lone Ranger TV show, the Lone Ranger movies, the two movies, and then a, an episode of Lassie, where he appeared at, in character as the Lone Ranger. And then after that, he literally never worked as an actor again, which is insane. And this is where I'm like, I'm not quite sure how much of this is typecasting and how much of this is he's just so obsessed with this character. And he just feels like the Lone Ranger is everything that he is, that he kind of almost self-sabotages himself. Because, look, do you get typecast after playing an iconic role like Superman or Lone Ranger or Luke Skywalker or whatever? Yes. But also when you're that iconic, you're going to you're going to find some commercials, voiceover, like there's stuff to do. And the fact that he never worked again after 1958 is fucking insane. And what's even crazier is that he just stayed. He lived as the Lone Ranger and like made a living appearing in character at autograph shows and personal appearances and, you know, corporate retreats, grocery store openings as the Lone Ranger. It's insane. Yes, it is insane. And it's also like, I mean, aside from like whatever copyright things would exist where like just nobody would be allowed to do this anymore. Big popular IP. It's also like nobody, no modern celebrities like want to do shit like this. Like the like the the actors who get really big for these big iconic roles. Like it's the exact opposite. They're like they do like a movie and a half and they're like, I think it's time to hang up the costume. I don't want to get too typecast as this and whatever they do, not even in character. But when they just when they do like I saw this, there's this guy on TikTok who he like j entered this contest where he wanted to go to the Guardians of the Galaxy 3 premiere with Karen Gillan. And he was like, you got to vote for me or whatever. And he won and he like went to this premiere and he posted a video where he's like, I'm at the premiere of Guardians of the Galaxy and here's Karen Gillan. And she's like, he made it. Woo. And like, she looks like a hostage. She looks like she's being held at gunpoint, forced to do this. Like they'll, they'll do stuff like this where it's like, oh, I have to go and like meet with a, f with a fan or whatever. And it looks like they want to die. Like I can't imagine anybody having even a, even like 10% of this enthusiasm about wanting to like continue playing the characters that they play. Yeah. I mean, the, the situation with, with Clayton Moore, I think is kind of dual. It's hard for an actor who has no real like skill in a you know, marketable way. If you're not an actor, like, what do you use that skill for? Sales? Selling timeshares in the Cayman Islands? Selling timeshares in the Cayman Islands. Um, you know, how do you, how do you make a living for your family if you're so identified with this one role that you can't get work or you think you can't get work? 
I find it a little hard to believe that he would never have a single role after 1958 if there wasn't a part of him that didn't want another role. He really genuinely believed, I am the Lone Ranger. This creed is what I believe in. The character's attributes are a symbolic representation of everything I hope I can be in real life and maybe sometimes fail at. And so it's more comfortable to constantly hide in a character that has no faults because I, as a human, of course, have faults. Um, yeah, and that, and that especially for a character like that to exist in that world and then to come out of it. And like even, you know, it doesn't even have to be a person that like is extremely flawed, just any normal person to get to like get to embody a character that is like the ultimate good, like just uh, heroic light through and through and to have to come off of it and be like, oh, I'm just a normal person. And like I fucking make mistakes and I've done I have regrets in my life. Like that's probably that's probably I can imagine that being difficult for anybody. Yeah, I think it absolutely can. And I think there's also something of like because it's so identifiable and gives you a sense of identity when that identity is stripped away from you by external factors, it makes you want the identity that much more, right? Like you're constantly like, no, I am the Lone Ranger, goddammit. Even if the TV shows and the movies are done, I am the Lone Ranger, fucking goddammit. So I think that's a component of it. And then another component of it too is like, you know, I heard an interview with Brendan Fraser where he was talking about uh, the kid who plays Elvis, fucking Austin Butler, and how everybody's kind of mocking Austin Butler because... He's not speaking in his actual voice. He's still, two years later, speaking in his Elvis voice, you know, lower southern accent, you know, well, how did my um, that thing. And Brendan Fraser was talking about it and he said, you know, I, I get it. Sometimes you play a role and it works for you and you become addicted to that cycle of people enjoying the thing you're doing and then you, it carries over into your real life and you don't know how to let it go because you're getting this positive feedback for something and you want that positive feedback as a human. So you just continue doing things that aren't endemically authentic to you as an individual, but are now a part of this broader image of you. And the, the separation between where that character stops and where you begin as a performer gets really blurry and messy and hard. And he's, he framed it as like, I'm guilty of wearing cowboy hats way after having finished shooting Westerns because it was a positive experience for me. And obviously Austin Butler still talking like Elvis because everyone's like, Oh my God, you're fucking great. It's Elvis. And so I can, I can see how yeah, and you, you still haven't gone back to using your original heavy German accent. No, no, I haven't. It's true. I'm still doing this bullshit American thing. I can see that and how that would be, you know, what are your assets to move forward with? What is the, what are the things that allow you to try and springboard into a new era in your life? And you're like, well, I can start at zero or I can start at first base. I can try and start something new, but use the Lone Ranger as a springboard because everyone on Earth knows what the Lone Ranger is. And um, I totally get that. Yeah. And on the other hand, like I'm not saying the Lone Ranger is lame, but just conceptually, it's like the lamest possible starting point you can have in the realm of like, oh, I have this existing thing that I can capitalize off of. Not because the Lone Ranger is lame, but because if you if your thing is that you were the Lone Ranger, but you can't they don't want you to make more Lone Ranger movies. The only thing you can do with that character is go to fucking grocery stores and cut ribbons and stuff like that. Like it's a really shitty starting place. Yeah, totally. Um, and and the thing that's interesting about it, too, is that so he does this. He does this. You know, I'm going to go to dealers, car dealerships. I'm going to go to grocery store openings. I'm going to do these public appearances as a Lone Ranger. And he does it basically on and off for 40 years as his job. The thing that's really interesting about it to me, though, is that there are these certain windows where he tries to do other things. But to add evidence to exactly what you're saying he doesn't try to do things as Clayton Moore, the man. He tries to start on first or second base by doing another thing with the Lone Ranger. Case in point, he started a chain of restaurants. Do you want to guess what these restaurants are called? Uh, Kimosabe Cabin. It's either better or worse. They're called the Lone Ranger Restaurant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense because if you're trying to capitalize off of it, you got to you got to just be very straightforward, like no, no getting clever about this. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there was two of them in the Los Angeles area. 
Um, and I found somebody, I found this website called oldlarestaurants.com where people just like in the greater LA area, like write reviews of their memory of old restaurants that no longer exist in Los Angeles, which is such a weird, cool thing. I was going to say, you, you're saying that like it's like this weird, like crazy thing, but I'm going to go to that website directly after we're done recording. It's pretty weird. It's pretty weird. I'm into it. But somebody specifically wrote an entry about the Lone Ranger restaurant, which I'm now going to ask you, Spapa Spicy, to please read. Around 1970, food places began popping up around Southern California, sporting the name of two great cowboy stars. You had your Roy Rogers roast beef sandwich places, which, through change of ownership, evolved into the current chain that bears Roy's moniker. In their original form, they were more like Arby's, but much better. But also not, because Arby's is amazing, and the thing I just said was a lie. I knew you were going to say that. I almost prefaced this with a fucking Arby's is shit joke. Now they aren't. You also had around L.A. five or six Lone Ranger restaurants, including one at Pico and Westwood and another one over on Wilshire, a few blocks west of Bundy. I remember liking the name and the looks of the place and being very, very disappointed in the cuisine. It was difficult to bite into one of their burgers and not get to wondering what had become of silver. But there was a reason to go to the Lone Ranger restaurants, and that was that on weekends, the Lone Ranger himself would appear at one or another of them. And I don't mean any old out-of-work actor in a mask. This out-of-work actor was Clayton Moore himself, and boy, did he still look good in the costume. To this day, I'm kicking myself that, for some reason, it never dawned on me to take a camera and get my picture with Kimosabi. Moore would arrive in a very nice trailer dressing room, accompanied by a very Caucasian lady in an Indian squaw costume. She called herself Tanta. (laughs) And she was apparently an executive in the Lone Ranger business, which I think was then the Rather Corporation. Mr. Moore would shake hands and pose for pics and sign autographs, largely for folks who weren't always aware that they were in the presence of the actual guy who'd played the role for years on TV. If you said something to him that indicated you knew who he was, i.e. Clayton Moore, not the Lone Ranger, you'd see a glimmer of delight behind the mask and he'd talk to you in a whole different way, answering questions about his films and TV appearances. He might even take you into the trailer for the kind of conversation he couldn't have in front of the general public, where he always had to be the masked man as opposed to the actor. And if you you were really lucky, he'd give you a silver bullet. He didn't give those to just anybody. Despite this, and for reasons obvious to anyone who actually ate at one, the Lone Ranger restaurants were a quick flop. I think they all closed in less than a year, but it was worth enduring the burgers to shake hands with Clayton Moore, and yes, I still have my silver bullet. Kind of amazing, right? Yeah, the, the, that's like the, the dude buries the lead in the, uh, in the entire review where he's just like, yeah, I'm just reviewing this restaurant. They're pretty bad, and like if you go there every once in a while... You see the Lone Ranger. But also, what I'm saying is I had a once-in-a-lifetime direct personal experience where I got to hang out and talk to Clayton Moore, and he shared a bunch of inside stories with me and then gave me a silver bullet. But I, like, passingly referenced that at the very end. (laughs) Yeah, what I wouldn't do for one of those uh, silver bullets and a chance to hang out with Clayton Moore, man. He just totally buries the lead on the fact that that was like an amazing experience that he had and puts it into the form of a restaurant review. I'm very curious about if the restaurants were started by the Rather Corporation or not, Um, specifically because Clayton Moore and the Rather Corporation very soon are going to have a lot of conflict. And I'm curious, my, my understanding of it was that the Rather Corporation was doing their thing. They had gotten the rights. They had bought the rights from, you know, the people who owned it, whether that be Fran Stryker and George Trindle or WXYZ in, um, in Michigan. I don't know. But they owned the rights. And that at a certain point, they came into conflict with Clayton Moore because he wouldn't stop appearing as the Lone Ranger. But if this is right, where they at one point were on the same team and they opened these restaurants together... Maybe that's a different thing. Uh, for some reason, my understanding prior to doing research on, the, on all this was that Clayton Moore himself opened these restaurant chains. I don't know if that's true or not. Over the course of, you know, from 1958 till, you know, probably about late 70s, the idea that Clayton Moore tours around as the Lone Ranger starts to kind of pick up cultural steam. People start becoming aware of this fact. And it kind of becomes a something of a meme in the days before memes. Um, in fact... 
Jay Thomas, who's a comedian, had a Lone Ranger story that he would tell every year on late night at Christmas. The tradition of you being here for the holidays and the quarterback challenge, the story about you working for a small radio station in a southern town. That's right. That's right. And, um, and uh, I had told this story only privately. It's the and best it, story I've ever heard. And it was Christmas about 10 or 12 years ago. And I come out with my little story planned. And you said, give me a gift. And I said, what is it? Tell me this story about you mm -hmm. and the Lone Ranger. And, right. and I had never told it publicly. So um, I, I worked for a small radio station. Uh, boy, it was actually big in the area. Big Ways, it was called, W-A-Y-S. And we would open the car dealerships. And back then, I was one of the few white guys with, a, with an afro. I had the big, giant afro. And we would open the car dealership. And so a guy um, named Pickle Moore. Pickle Moore, we have a picture, by the way, of Pickle Moore with the Lone Ranger. Uh, this picture's never been shown before. Yeah. That's Pickle, that's the Lone Ranger, and that's the car dealership. That's a used Dodge truck. There's the Lone There's Ranger. There's the Lone Ranger. Clearly, right. a sense of humor. Right. Right, that's Picklemore. Uh -huh. uh, his daughter sent that uh, to us, so I want to thank her. I know her name is Sweet Relish. I don't know what her last name is. But... <laughs> so I go to the thing, and I'm talking and doing the remote and come down and get an oil change and buy a truck and the whole thing. And the Lone Ranger is there, and he's and the kids are coming, and he's got the guns and everything else. <laughs> My friend Mike Martin, uh, who's in the record industry, uh, he comes to visit me, and he's got the long, long hair and the big stacked heels and the, and the tight jeans like a, like a Bay City roller. And so he gets me, and we go out to the dumpster, and we begin to get herbed up. Um, we... <laughs> We become medicinally enhanced we, as the performance. We only hear that phrase herbed up once a once year. Once a year. Once a year. <laughs> we all it's look for it herbed up. Yeah. Herbed up once a year. That's yeah, a lovely yeah. tradition. That's right. Yeah. So, so as I keep going back and forth, we're, you know, we're more and more herbal. So, um, <laughs> so we do it. We're there for hours, and it's time to leave, and no one comes to get uh, uh, Clayton Moore, the Lone Ranger, and to take him back to the Red Carpet Inn on Moorhead Avenue. <laughs> So we wait a while, and no one comes. The sales manager was drunk. I don't know what happened. Pickle Moore had left. I don't know what was going on. So I said, well, why don't we'll take you back. And Lone I Ranger all dressed up just as in the photo. Just with the guns and the whole thing. Yeah, and the, the mask. mask. Never takes it off. Yeah. Never relaxes. Right. He, you know, nothing. <laughs> so I have a 10-year-old Volvo, okay? And it's all beat up. And there's like, you know, fast food crap in the back of it and everything else. And we put the Lone Ranger in. And Mike and I get in there. And all we're thinking is we can't act stoned. So we... <laughs> And my hair is so big, and he's got so much hair, he can't see out of the front window because it's like Starsky and Hutch are in the front with it. And we are looking straight ahead, and we are so nervous, and we get in this traffic. It's not moving. No one is saying a word. It's dead silent in my Volvo. And this middle-aged guy in a, in a Buick in the front of us doesn't like the traffic. He decides to back up, crashes into my car. I hear my headlight break. Oh. And I, 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 we look around, you know, and he drives away, and there's that pause that stone people have before they react. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we decide to chase the guy in my Volvo. <laughs> the Volvo has five cylinders, right? <laughs> so I get out of traffic, and, I, and we're chasing the Buick. We can't, and the Lone Ranger is in the back, <laughs> completely stoic. <laughs> I swear to God. So we catch up to the guy. We can see him. You know, he's a middle-aged guy. We pull in front of him, right in front of Anderson Seafood Restaurant. Uh -huh. I swear to God, okay. it's all there. And Mike and I jump out, and he says, what are you guys doing? I said, you backed into my car, and you broke my headlight. He says, I did not. I said, yes, you did. He says, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to call the cops. He says, oh, really? Well, who do you think they're going to believe? You two hippie freaks are me. And the Lone Ranger gets out of the back of my car. <laughs> I swear to God, he goes like this. They'll believe me, citizen. <laughs> I swear to God. Thank you. So good. That is an pretty amazing solid, story. right? That's an amazing story. It really, I mean, it was an entertaining story the whole time, but it just, I didn't know where it was going. And it, that was a great story. And also, like, again, it just shows you of like, 
he was that character all the time. You know, like at some point you're kind of like Clayton Moore is not, you know, it's, it's really this the Batman Bruce Wayne thing. Where it's like Clayton Moore is the thing he got saddled with at birth and the Lone Ranger is who he truly is, you know. Um, so, uh, let's, let's watch this 1983 clip from the Golden Boot Awards, just to get a sense of, uh, who Clayton Moore was as the Lone Ranger. Um, he's at an, so for context, he's giving a, like a speech at an award show. Pep's uh, sidekick show was really nice. Brought back many, many memories to me. I only wish that my sidekick, Jay Silverheels, could be with me tonight. Wonderful man to work with, and a great friend. I used to listen to Jay Silverheel's Indian Prayer. Jay often said to me, how about doing the Lone Ranger Creed for me, Clay? Well, Tano, here it is. I believe to have a friend, a man must be one. That all men are created equal, and everyone has the right and the power within themselves to help make this a greater world. I believe that God put the firewood on earth, but every man must gather and light it himself. We must make the best of what equipment that we have. And I believe in being prepared physically, mentally, and morally to fight when necessary for that which is right. I believe that sooner or later, somewhere, somehow, we must settle with this earth and make payment for what we have taken. That this country of the people and by the people and for the people shall live forever. That everything changes, but the truth, the truth alone lives on forever. I believe in my creator, my country, and my fellow cowboys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, is that creed kind of a corny 1950s idea of what it means to be american yeah is it weirdly you know christian oriented yes do i still fucking love it yeah yeah i I got i got i got sidetracked with something but what i was gonna say or the moment that i was in watching it was like this is fucking epic this is intense yeah dude i i love i i I hate that i love it as much as i do (laughs) i don't want to love it that much Yeah, I mean, it, and it was, it's not just the words, it was just that performance, like, that was just so, that was so epic, it was so intense. Yeah, at, like, some weird, like, country music award show, and yet he's still just, like, he is the Lone Ranger, you know? Also, for the record, he's wearing a baby blue suit, a giant cowboy hat, and giant black aviator sunglasses that are coincidentally the same size as a domino mask. Like, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, and he, yeah, he get, he gives it like the level of gravitas that I'm sure nobody expected or cared for him to give it. Like I'm, I'm sure nobody there was just like, yes, he met the moment. They were just like, I'm like he he didn't need to do that. All he needed to do was just show up and be like, I'm this guy. Remember? Yeah, remember me? I'm a I'm a cowboy guy. He fucking he was pl- he was playing to the he was playing to the fucking gods. It would be in 1979 that things would take a darker turn for Clayton Moore, however. The actor, who had been making a living doing public appearances since 1958, was about to get into hot water with Jack Rather, the owner of the Lone Ranger's rights. Rather, who was prepping and about to release a new big-budget version of the Ranger called The Legend of the Lone Ranger, obtained a court order to prohibit Moore from making public appearances as the Lone Ranger. Operation came in. And said, you can't go out on the road any longer and you can no longer wear the mask because we're doing this new film. The rebellion was heard across, forget across the country, it was heard worldwide. So it was a really interesting thing to see someone really embrace this character and the fans follow suit. What did your dad think when the Rather Corporation said, no, you can't wear the mask anymore? He was hurt. Was he uh, shocked? He was shocked, but he was he was personally hurt because the bottom line is is he had been portraying this character with such sincerity and with such good faith, and every and let's face it, everything he was doing was furthering 
the rather corporations the value of that character, right? So in the reality is, is, is while he was earning a living, that was his sole so source of income, he also was continuing the property. Well, he did the pizza roll commercial. He did all kinds of mm -hmm. other things, appearances. And then once Rather took the mask away from him, Ray-Ban stepped in and designed a pair of sunglasses in the same style that the mask was. It was Dad was pretty, you know, he was pretty clever when he found those um, kind of ski goggle type glasses. <laughs> Yeah, Corning came to him and said, oh, hey, you'd make a great spokesperson. So that actually wound up kind of, kind of good. It was that fun. was a good thing. It was fun. In terms of his legacy, you haven't written a book yet. So let's talk about this, uh, let's talk about this uh, Corning ad for a second. I <laughs> now, but real quick, not real quick. I think that what he was doing was great. I loved every second of it. I'm a fan. Was there a, a mass outcry of people being like, no, let him continue showing up to these ribbon cuttings? I, th I don't think that was necessarily true. I think that was a bit of rose tinted glasses on the part of his daughter. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that worldwide everyone was like, <gasps> Clayton Moore needs to be able to open Safeways. But maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Uh, but let's talk about this uh, Corning sun sensor lens uh, glasses ad. Uh, it's it's him in the, the Lone Ranger baby blue get up wearing instead of a domino mask, giant 1980s sunglasses. Hello, I am the solitary soldier. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the marketing text on it says, here is my heroic uh, face covering. Yeah. Uh, the, the marketing text on it says Corning unmasks 1981 marketing programs, Corning sun sensor lenses that chain. Let's ride down the street. Kibbles now. <laughs> my horse is named Kibbles. That wasn't clear. I think that he did multiple of these like sunglass ads, though. I'm, I, I couldn't find the other one, but I, I think he did another one, which you'll hear about in a second. Jack Rather was worried that Moore's continuing appearances of the character would damage his efforts to resubmit the character into the popular consciousness. Also, for the record, there were rumors that Moore would be reprising the role of the character for the film. Many people think that these rumors were stoked by Moore himself. This court order backfired on Rather, however. Moore responded by filing a countersuit and then slightly changing the costume and starting to wear Foster Grand wraparound sunglasses and started appearing in Foster's Grants ad campaigns with the tagline, who's behind these Foster Grants? The whole lawsuit just looked like a David and Goliath story. Here was this poor, obviously out of work actor who was just trying to make a living and this big shot movie producer was trying to strip him of the only thing that he had left. It was not a good look. Public opinion strongly favored Moore in all of this. And this all became the backdrop to The Legend of the Lone Ranger when it was released, and it failed. And then after, Rather dropped the lawsuit and then died two months later of cancer. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like, I'm fucking done. Fuck it. I'm you out. Keep dressing as the character. I'm out. <laughs> How dare you treat Clayton Moore like this? You think he's some person named Jack? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, Jack Rather. You're a Jack. I'm a Clayton. We know who's going to win this, you subhuman. Yeah. What do you what do you think about this, though? Do you think uh, do you think this is justified on Jack Rather's perspective? Do you think it's cool that Clayton Moore run one? Is it weird that they dropped the case? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, the the part that we've been talking about, this idea that like this is just kind of a strange way of living your life and what I like. Um, I don't know, maybe I would. I don't even I don't even want to speak for that. Who fucking knows if I if I like got mega famous for playing some character and then left, and then like the opportunities to play that character in an official capacity went away. Would I end up just like doing ribbon cuttings and shit? I, maybe I would. Maybe I don't even want to say that I wouldn't. Um, but it is it is an, a, an odd way of, of living your life. It's an odd fixation. It's a strange an interesting way of making a living, I suppose. Um, but on the other hand, and, and also, you know, from a, from, I guess a business perspective, 
it's like, yeah, they had the ownership of this character. Like, you can't just keep doing this. Like, you don't own the character. These people go own it. If they want you to stop doing it, like, what, what are you going to do? Um, you know, they, they want to utilize it for things that, in theory, are much more compelling than a grocery store ribbon cutting. Um, but also, on the other hand, you know, in reality, I don't – I think that these – like, th th this way that people – develop these straw strangleholds on IP and hoard them like fucking treasure is stupid. And, you know, is there a world where they could make awesome Lone Ranger movies and TV shows and still let Clayton Moore go to ribbon cuttings and just keep embodying this character because he loves it so much? Absolutely. If they weren't obsessed with like hoarding wealth and, you know, making sure that they didn't lose a single cent of profit. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think like just let him fucking go around giving you free publicity and doing this character that he loves doing. Absolutely. I get why from a like this would never happen now. They would fucking destroy him. He would be he would have been fucking buried in 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 lawsuits up to his fucking eyeballs. Um, but in 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 reality, morally, ethically, just my own personal opinion. Yeah. Let him do this. Leave him alone. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost kind of like this weird extended performance art piece that he did over 40 years. And I would I would almost be a little more into it if it didn't if he wasn't obviously constantly trying to milk money out of it. Because, um, you know, like the final the final thing we're going to talk about is Ranger Realty. So in, in 1964, Clayton moved to Golden Valley, Minnesota, where he, his wife and his daughter settled and he obtained a real estate license, much like his father and opened Ranger Realty, where he became a land developer and lived in Minnesota for many years. While living there, he apparently helped free a local grocery store clerk after a robbing had transpired at a corner store. And, like, he went in, not in costume, because he's, like, just in his everyday life. He, like, went in, untied the grocery store clerk, and then said, You've been rescued by the Lone Ranger. Which, like, out of context, you're like, that guy's insane. That guy's insane. That guy's insane. But like this is what I'm saying. Like where he had the line of restaurants, he had the real estate business, he had these public public appearances, and like I'm into the idea that he can't let the character go. That's really fascinating to me, and I understand it. I get it. The fact that he couldn't make any of these businesses ideas that he had work outside of the Lone Ranger idea is kind of really sad, you know. Like that's what George Lazenby did after he his acting career fell apart. He came to Santa Monica, and became a real estate agent. He didn't name his real estate company Bond Realty. Although that, that would have been a great name, though. It would have been. It would have been cool, you know. Uh, but it's just so it's so it's interesting to me. And I I can't quite wrap my head around why you would keep. I mean, I get it. I get why you would keep trying to return to the well. But I also kind of don't. And I'm like, don't you want to start a new leaf? Don't you want to turn over a, a new era and try and do something new? And he really didn't. There's a photo of him. This So this episode was inspired by a photo that I saw of him as like an 84, 83-year-old man. After he moved back to California, he was living in Calabasas. And it's him in his house. It's like a standard old person house. But he's wearing a full fucking Lone Ranger costume sitting on the couch. That image was so haunting to me because it encapsulated everything we've been talking about. Of This person was just so defined by this role that they couldn't escape it for good or ill. And I was like, I got to I got to write about this guy. I got to We got to talk about this guy. Um, Yeah, I don't know. It's very sad and also kind of cool and also sad again. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, I, I, I get exactly what you're talking about, and I, I hope that comes across to the audience. I don't know if they have necessarily the frame of reference, because I think it's very easy to go one way or the other, like see this and just be like, ah, this fucking, this dude is pathetic. Or kind of the other way, the, the more nostalgist way where you look in the YouTube comments of all these videos we've been watching, and people were just like, Clayton Moore, an absolute legend, like, you know, just, just like re really revering him as a legendary figure for what he did and what he was. But the idea that it exists in this much more gray, nuanced area where you have somebody who simultaneously had a reverence and a love for a character, but also a financial dependence 
on the uh, on the notoriety or the opportunity that the character presented. So they're simultaneously holding onto the character and and paying a tremendous amount of reverence to it, but also exploiting it for money in a really sad way. They're simultaneously a walking love letter to a character, but also like the sad emblem of the way in which Hollywood chews up and spits people out, the way in which characters are taken and turned into commodities and used for wealth building as opposed to storytelling. Um, it's it's really, it, you know, the, there's this guy that I, I know that I used to be in a sketch comedy group with, um, and he's a, he's a little older, and his whole thing was that he did, I mean, he's, he's an actor, but he did impressions. And his big thing that he really capitalized off of throughout, you know, 2015 leading into, you know, the, the pandemic, and stuff shutting down was that he did a Trump impression and he played the Trump character any chance he could. And, you know, he did, a, he, he was the guy who would play Trump. If we did a sketch that involved Trump in the sketch comedy group I was in and he did it, he made videos of him playing Trump. And it was just, it was a thing that he really capitalized off of. And he wasn't even a, he didn't even have a good Trump impression. Like he, he was just like, it was okay. And then he actually got hired to play Trump in some sketches on the Jimmy Kimmel show. He, he, he's got so much into his head of thinking like, oh, like Trump is my character and like I play this character and it's like a very specific thing and I have all these like ideas and rules about how I do it that he started like trying to give them like creative feedback on the sketches and being like, oh, well. I think it should be like this, and I think it should be like this. And essentially, they were just like, eh, we'll just get a different guy. And they just replaced him. Like, he had this genuine opportunity to get a consistent job being the Trump actor on Jimmy Kimmel. Anytime they used, they had a, a sketch with Trump in it. And he ruined it because he just got so much in his head thinking that he, like, owned this character that they just were like, yeah, this is way more trouble than it's worth. We're just going to get a different guy to play Trump. And now he, he legitimately, I don't know how he makes all of his money, but his whole thing is that he makes cameos as this Trump character. And he's constantly hawking his cameos on like Facebook and stuff like that. He's like, you can get a cameo of me as of Trump or whatever. And he like sells fucking cameos of himself just being like, you're fired to like random people in his like not good Trump impression. <laughs> and it's like, it's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. And and I, I see this as being very similar to that. But unlike the Trump thing where it's like, what are you talking about? Like, you don't own this. This is just like some guy and you just do a bad impression of him. Unlike that, this there's also this other love of this character in this. And it's like, it's this like weird, bittersweet mixture of the two. It's almost a perfect one to one example of the fucked up and way in which like uh, creativity and commodity are intertwined in the movie business or in any kind of creative business. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you said bittersweet. You know, I think it's there's something deeply admirable about you find your the the you know, your codex for reality. You find your character that you feel like represents everything you aspire to be and then you try to embody that character for the rest of your life and you literally are embodying a fictional person i think that's admirable and cool and deeply weird and then also finding that there's no other way to make money as a performer is like i i just don't really buy that there's no you, you can't get any job really nothing you always have to be this lone ranger i mean look would it be weird if the lone ranger like worked at fucking olive garden sure but also like you got a family you got to do what you got to do i don't know maybe i maybe i'm being too callous about it but it, there's there's bittersweet it's very bittersweet but deeply fascinating to me he's like a hybrid between andrew wk and laz rojas yeah for real yeah let's watch this uh let's watch this little uh eulogy about him I was gonna say, is this footage of him dying <laughs> you just have the footage of his death it's like a it's like a snuff film. 
<laughs> in the script, it's got a link to a YouTube video, and it just says, he dies. You wrote, he dies, colon, and then the link to the video. <laughs> In other news today, the actor who was the Lone Ranger for nearly a decade has died in California. His name was Clayton Moore. He had a heart attack. He was 85. ABC's Brian Rooney reports that for many of us growing up, he was a giant television character. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. In the thrilling days of yesteryear's television, the Lone Ranger was one of the first heroes of the new medium. Take care of the wounded man. I'm going after them. Clayton Moore played the part of the lone survivor of an ambush who, with his sidekick Tonto, dedicates his life to ridding the West of outlaws. Firing silver bullets, Moore was the Lone Ranger in television and movies from 1949 until 1958. He effectively became the part he played and spent the rest of his life making public appearances in character. In the late 1970s, the producers of a new Lone Ranger movie temporarily stopped Moore from appearing as the Ranger. But even lawyers couldn't keep the hero down. The cowboy will always be the symbol of the American heritage, the fair play, and the honesty, the good guy in the white hat. And his name is the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger often left a silver bullet as a memento of good winning over evil. It became Clayton Moore's legacy to American culture. Brian Rooney, ABC News, Hollywood. I just have to repeat one last time that it is crazy that in the 1949 or 43 around that area version of this thing, there was an actual Native American man playing Tonto. And in the 2013 movie, it was a white guy in red face. That's insane. <laughs> Today, Clayton Moore is buried in Glendale at the Forest Lawn Memorial Park. And uh, yeah, deeply interesting, fascinating person. I think I've said most of my thoughts in terms of how bizarre, unconventional, and deeply strange it is to live your life this way. But also kind of admirable, kind of cool, and uh, I find it fascinating. Do you have any closing thoughts, Mr. Spice? Yeah, I mean, I kind of I kind of already said it just in my last little thing. Um, I, I, I think it's similar to you. I think it's simultaneously like very interesting and admirable in a way, but then also sad. And I, I, I think it's funny, even in that last little interview thing, he was just he was the king of giving us more than we asked for. He's like, he's like, oh, you want me to like be interviewed in this quick little like red carpet thing? I'm going to fucking deliver like a heroic hero's journey speech. And the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 as like a 70 year old man still in costume too, like, like straight up, like grandpa wearing the suit. I, it's so fascinating to yeah, me. Yeah. The reporter's like, I just thought you'd say like, it's great to be here, but like, that was amazing. Thanks. <laughs> Like he he gave he gave you much more than you were asking for, and you were always appreciative of of the and then even like the restaurant thing, the fact that like half the people didn't even know that it was a real Lone Ranger actor. They thought it was just some dude that they hired to show up in the costume or whatever. Also, can we just talk briefly about Tonta? Oh yeah, yeah, Tonta, <laughs> Tonta. Especially if she was like an executive of the fucking company. Like, how do you, how did that conversation come about? Clayton Moore is like, I'll only sign on to endorse this restaurant chain if I can appear every third Saturday as the Lone Ranger. And she was like, okay, what about Tonto? And he's like, Jay, Silver, Jay, Jay Silverheels is fucking dead. That's There, not there will never like, oh. be another Tonto to me. Yeah. And then she's like, what about a Tonta? Hail Silver! Away! And here's my sexy sidekick, Tonta. <laughs> it sounds so bad. It sounds like something from the comics. It sounds like something that, like, you know, there would be, like, a Lone Ranger twenty nine ninety nine. And now with Tonta, the gender-bent Tonto. <laughs> yeah, and it's just, like, it's just, like, a, it's full, like, 90s like Rob Liefeld style. She just has like giant boobs and just like a, a, her waist is like a pencil. Yeah. I, I, there's been so many versions of Lone Ranger and there's a small part of me that really wants there to be a nineties, like jacked version of it. Um, I don't think I would like it, but you know, 
In fact, once I know an animation producer who I'm good friends with who had the rights to The Lone Ranger for a minute and was developing a show where the idea was that The Lone Ranger, their like high concept was that The Lone Ranger was like Randy Ortiz. And so he was like super angry and like fucking ripped and that Tonto was like the calming factor for him and helped him like maintain his rage. And it was like Lone Ranger was like the Hulk. And I remember him, like, telling me this, and I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. Well, inside being like, no, that's not the Lone, no, that's not the Lone Ranger. Well, that's, that's, that's an interesting thing to talk about is, like, they, like, revival of, of, uh, of the Lone Ranger, like there was with the Phantom, like that, the cartoon, and, like, it just seems like, it seems like they can't bring Westerns back. It just doesn't seem like it's, it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen, like, even even back in be even back at that time in uh in 20 well i mean back in like there was like a there was like this all attempt at a, at a revival of westerns in like 2008 or so where they had like the appaloosa remake with with um with uh yeah and they also had 310 310 to yuma also yeah, 310 to and... yuma with with christian bale and uh and then uh, the the fucking the the Coen Brothers oh the Coen Brothers True Grit yeah true the True Grit remake with Jeff Bridges and like it, it just it, it didn't go over the top though like it didn't it was they were like tr- and they, and those and like True Grit did well like f- like financially but it just didn't go over the top and the, a similar thing happened with Pirates where for the longest time the pirate swas- swashbuckling as a genre was just dead in in you know famously they tried to make that Cutthroat Island movie, and it was so big of a failure that it sunk the studio. But then they did it with with Pirates of the Caribbean. Like they brought they they rev, they successfully revived the pirate genre. But they but it doesn't seem like they can do it with westerns. It just they, like and also and also just they didn't revive the pirate genre. They turned that genre into a singular franchise. Like other than Pirates of the Caribbean, there are no yeah. There's films no other like big movies. pirate movies, but there doesn't need to be. It's like the fat. It was like for a while, it was like the Fast and the Furious, where it's just like this is a genre. This movie yeah. franchise, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it, does, it doesn't seem like they they can do it with with westerns. They try to all the time, and I love westerns, but they just they're just like a they're just so antiquated in some particular way that they just don't seem to be able to resonate with anybody at all anymore at like a large scale. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, and they've tried to bring the Lone Ranger back, back multiple times. Like they had a CW TV show starring Chad Michael Murray that they like shot a full pilot for. Uh, and you can find it online. Um, but also to me, Chad Michael Murray. Oh yeah, I'm so glad that that didn't happen because that sounds terrible. Not, not John Reed. But also actually in that version, if memory serves correctly, He's not John Reed. I think his name is like Luke Hartsman, Luke Huntsman, something like that. And he's not he's not John Reed. So when Dan Reed gets killed, it's not like he's like searching for vengeance for his brother. He's just like that guy I knew, Dan, got to go, got to go find Butch Ca- Cavendish now. Who do you, who do you think could play a, a uh, the Lone Ranger? Cuz even like like sexual assault stuff notwithstanding, like that happened later. Even Army Hammer, I didn't really think was that was like a good choice for Lone Ranger. I mean, he kind of has the like all American Boy Scout thing to him, but I didn't I didn't really think it was that compelling. But I think the the emphasis is that you need to make the Lone Ranger like a classic, you know, paragon of virtue and justice, which is hard today getting that through the system because people are like so jaded and they're like, no, he can't be flawless. It's like, well, no, it's about the weight of being flawless. It's about trying to stay to be a true arrow, not, uh, you know, a true straight arrow. Um, you know, I could actually see, speaking of straight arrows, I could actually see, uh, he's probably a little too old now, but I could see uh, Marsden. What the fuck is his name? Cyclops? Um, oh, James Marsden? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I think he would make a great Lone Ranger. Um, even now, like I could see them doing kind of like an Unforgiven style movie about like an older, an older Lone Ranger coming back and having to do something, you know, help somebody out. And not that James Marsden is old. He's not. But, you know, these franchises, they want people in their like late 20s, early 30s. And he's like late 40s, early 50s, question mark. 
He looks amazing, though. And actually, uh, he played a cowboy in Westworld and was amazing as that Teddy character. I hadn't even thought of that. I was just thinking of the like Cyclops straight arrow thing that he does so well. Um, Yeah, I would love to see him. Yeah, but I feel I also kind of feel like Lone Ranger, Superman, these big Boy Scout characters, they work really well when it's an unknown playing them because you don't have a preconceived notion of who the person is yet. Um, so you can really delve into that like flawless thing because the audience doesn't have a relationship with the person where they maybe did or didn't like them in certain roles. Um, that's why Brandon Routh works so well in that Superman Returns movie because and same thing with Christopher Reeve, a Superman like you, you, you get to look at the character, not the actor. Um, yeah, well, look, this has been a great time. We've been talking about some Lone Ranger for longer than I thought we would. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. I love the Lone Ranger, I think, as is pretty evident in this episode. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm Dave Baker. And I'm Spandrew Spice. This has been Deep Cuts. If you'd like to find me on the internet, you can do so at heydavebaker.com. Spandrew, where can people find you? You can find me. (laughs) I'm not even going to say that. I was going to make some joke about putting on red face. I'm not even going to go there. And... (laughs) And you can't find me on social media because I don't use social media. But if you want to pay your respect to the dear beloved Papa Pricey, you can get his book, Deadbolt AI Private Eye, by going to dapricerights.com and picking it up. You can follow us on social media by going to Facebook and searching Deep Cuts Podcast or by joining the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group where we talk about the show, make memes, other stuff. You can join our Discord server, bit.ly.com slash Discord where we talk about the show, make memes, play games, have conversations, all kinds of stuff. I just added a, a music bot to the server. So now you can like load up a playlist of music and everybody can listen to it together. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at Deep Cuts Pod. You can follow us on TikTok at Mystery Treehouse. You can go to our site, deepcutspod.com. Click on the shop. You can get hats and t-shirts and all kinds of good stuff. And that's it. Deep Cuts is a production by Boy Genius Media. If you'd like to find this show and others like it, please visit boygeniusmedia.com or deepcutspod.com. If you want to join in on post-episode discussions, please join the Deep Cuts Podcast Facebook group. Finally, subscribe to our YouTube channel for additional video content.